Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. And I first wanna welcome everyone. My name is Freddie Kay and I'm the founder and president of Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are so excited to host our first webinar event, which we've never done. And uh, we had um, so many people registering, which is great. And we thank you so much. I'd like to give a shout out to Auditor Suzanne Bump, who I believe is joining us. Hello, Auditor Bump. And uh, there may be other elected officials I'm not aware of, I apologize. Hello to everyone. We are so glad that you are joining us. I wanna give a special thanks to Maureen Hansen, our Associate Director for being our IT person and figuring out how to set this all up with lots of details to make the event possible. Thank you, Maureen. And thank you as well to our board of directors for all your hard work, much appreciated. In just a moment, I will turn the program uh, over to Joelle Million for her wonderful presentation about the amazing Lucy Stone. I'm looking for my book, uh-oh. Um, but before I do that, I have a few announcements to make. One, if questions occur to you during the program, please type them into the chat. And after Joelle's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. And I'm very pleased that the Q&A session will be moderated by Katrina huff Larmond, our Suffrage 100 Massachusetts Vice President, Randolph Town Counselor, where she is the first woman of color elected to a town council seat there. And she's also a social worker and a, pro a professor and so much more. We're so looking forward to Katrina moderating the Q&A. This program is being recorded and a link will be emailed to each of you in the coming days. And you are welcome to enjoy the program again and share the link with family and friends. With that, I'm very pleased to offer this introduction of Joelle Million. Uh, before I start with the formal part, I just want to add that Joelle and I met in Brookfield, Massachusetts in August of 2018 on the 200th birthday of Lucy Stone. And Joelle also helped us unveil a Lucy Stone suffrage display panel, the ones that are on our website, and you may have seen them. That's part of our project with the Commonwealth Museum and it's on our website under resources. And that was a panel about Lucy Stone. So about Joelle, a native of <laughs> Illinois, Joelle Million received a Bachelor of Arts from Historic Illinois College in 1968. 30 years later, she received a Master of Arts from Minnesota State University, Mankato. During the intervening years, she had two children, with her first husband, a university football coach, with whom she lived in Utah, South Dakota, and Arizona before landing in Minnesota. There, after a divorce, she met her present husband, historian Johannes Postman. Living in Arizona when ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment needed three more states, she became an activist. When the National Organization for Women targeted Arizona as a possible ratifier, it hired Joelle to lead a political action committee to try to elect pro-ERA candidates to the state legislature. That experience piqued Joelle's interest in women's rights history, and soon she was immersed in the study <laughs> of Lucy Stone. After researching Stone's life and work for over 15 years, Joelle used part of her research to write a thesis comparing the primary source record of Stone's role in the early suffrage movement with her treatment in what Joelle calls the Stanton Anthony tradition. For that considerable production, she earned the Midwestern Association of Graduate Schools 1999 Distinguished Master's Thesis Award. Publication in 2003 of Joelle's book, Woman's Voice, Women's Place, Lucy Stone and the Birth of the Women's Rights Movement, provided a more thorough account of Stone's centrality 
to the movement, as well as a rebuttal to another biographer's negative portrayal of Stone's husband, Henry Blackwell. I have my book nearby, I'll pull it out in a minute. <laughs> With Johannes, Joelle pulled up her Midwestern roots in 2001 and replanted them in Western Massachusetts. And we are so glad she did. And with that, welcome, Joelle. Thank you, Freddie. And welcome, everyone. I, too, am so glad you've joined us tonight to learn more about Lucy Stone's work and influence as the most prominent and most effective spokesperson of America's early suffrage movement. Some of you may already know quite a lot about this famous daughter of Massachusetts, and others may know only her name and not much more. Wherever you are on the spectrum of acquaintance with Lucy Stone, I trust you'll learn some things tonight that might surprise you, because Lucy Stone's story doesn't quite fit the contours of the traditional story of the women's suffrage movement. Tonight, we're going to look only at Stone's work before the Civil War, when the movement's goals were broader than suffrage, but suffrage was seen as the means of achieving and protecting other rights. Stone was central to the post-Civil War movement as well. And I'll give a brief overview of her work then at the end of this presentation. There is so much that can be said about Stone's work in the pre-war period, because she was not only the movement's chief spokesperson, but also its primary leader, the motive force behind its national organization. So as we focus on Stone's role as the movement's silver-tongued orator, please keep in mind that Lucy Stone played an even larger role than the one we're covering tonight. So there were two periods of influence that led Lucy Stone, Lu Lucy Stone to decide to become both a woman's rights activist and an orator. First, woman's rights agitation within Garrisonian abolitionism during her youth shaped her sense of purpose to devote her life to elevating women. And second, her experience at Oberlin College convinced her of the need for a deliberate movement to reach behind the customs and laws that kept women down to the minds and hearts of the populace that clung to those customs and laws. Public speaking was the medium for doing this. In the 19th century, in addition to being a popular medium of entertainment and adult education, oratory was a primary means of spreading ideas and shaping public opinion. Every town had at least one venue for lectures and many had lyceum committees that arranged weekly programs throughout the winter lecture season. 19th century Americans went to lectures the way 20th century Americans went to movies. But in 1846, when Stone decided to become a public speaker, oratory was still a male prerogative. Not much had changed in the decade since Angelina and Sarah Grimke's assault right here in Massachusetts on the social mores that reserved public speaking and public affairs more broadly to men. After the Grimke sisters' brief foray into public speaking, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society hired Abby Kelly as a lecturing agent, and she continued the press for women's acceptance on the public rostrum but Kelly met such public scorn and persecution for violating societal norms that few women dared to follow. Lucy Stone was influenced by both the Grimkes and Abby Kelly, as well as by the wider controversy over women's rights of which those women were a part. Born in West Brookfield in 1818, Lucy was still in her teens when William Lloyd Garrison sparked that controversy by urging women to circulate anti-slavery petitions. Women sent so many that Congress refused to receive any petition, anti-slavery petitions because most were sent by women who shouldn't be meddling in politics. Defying Congress, women abolitionists met in national convention, proclaimed their freedom from society's restrictions, 
and expanded their petitioning efforts. It was this 1837 convention, said Lucretia Mott, that marked the beginning of a movement for women's rights. Lucy Stone was one of hundreds of women who claimed their political rights by circulating anti-slavery petitions. She was also a firsthand witness to the backlash against women abolitionists and the Grimke sisters in particular, when as a spectator, she attended the minister's convention that issued the infamous pastoral letter denouncing women's in, uh, involvement in public affairs. The minister's insistence on female dependence and subservience incensed Lucy. She later said that if ever she had felt bound to silence by scripture or believed that women had different moral rights and duties from men, that pastoral letter broke her bonds. Garrison's anti-slavery paper, The Liberator, was Stone's window onto the controversy. When critics pressured him to stop promoting women's rights in his paper, Garrison proclaimed that as the Liberator's goal was universal emancipation, it would go for women's rights to their fullest extent. It was in The Liberator that Lucy Stone read Sarah Grimke's Letters on the Equality of the Sexes which she enthusiastically promoted among her family and from which she later drew for lectures. Through the Liberator, Stone followed Abby Kelly's courageous efforts to fully integrate women into the anti-slavery movement by securing their right to speak and vote at meetings with men. Following Kelly's example, Stone repeatedly raised her hand to vote at a church meeting, despite being told that women's votes would not be counted. And when the woman question was used to challenge Garrison's leadership and divided the American anti-slavery society into pro and anti-Garrison forces, there was no question where Stone's allegiance lay. Thrilled by all the agitation for women's equality swirling around her, Lucy told her brother Bowman she wished she hadn't been born for another 50 years so she could see the result and reap the benefit of the present contest. Bowman said she should be thankful to live at a time when she could help it on. Taking the rebuke to heart, Lucy decided to get the highest education available to her and become an educator of women like Mary Lyon. She entered Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, it was not yet a college, in 1839. But clashing with Lyon over both abolitionism and women's rights, she left after just one term. Stone was attending coeducational academies when she learned that 600 miles away in Ohio, Oberlin College had graduated three women. And off she went to Oberlin in 1843 at the age of 25, where she would become the first Massachusetts woman to earn a college degree. But Stone found that even at forward-looking Oberlin College, women's behavior was strictly defined and limited. Through a series of personal demonstrations, she challenged these limitations and insisted on equal treatment. An amazing victory came in what might be considered women's first strike for equal pay. Discovering that she had a peculiar persuasive power in challenging injustice, Stone began to think of becoming a public speaker. But it was a visit to Oberlin by Abby Kelly during Stone's third year, and the surprising, to Stone at least, denunciation that some of the college's most esteemed leaders heaped on Kelly that clinched uh, Stone's decision. For if such intelligent and liberal men could so vilify a woman doing the same work that in a man they would find praiseworthy, then perhaps the highest good she could do was try to extinguish the deep-seated beliefs and prejudices that kept women down. During Stone's senior year, she wrote to known advocates of women's rights, seeking advice on how to begin her work. And she made all kinds of plans with Antoinette Brown, a new student at who also wanted to become a public speaker but as a minister rather than a reformer. Stone expected to learn the art of public speaking in her rhetoric class, 
that found that Oberlin excused its women students from oral exercises. She could learn about debate and oratory, she just couldn't practice them. So Stone organized an off-campus club where she, Antoinette, and other women students could practice speaking free of faculty control. When Stone's preparation for a career in public speaking became widely known, both the Ohio and Massachusetts anti-slavery societies recruited her as a lecturing agent. She declined both offers, saying she was going to campaign for women's rights. So when Garrison met Stone on her graduation day in August, 1847, uh, he was scheduled to speak in town a few days later, he described Stone in a letter as a very superior young woman preparing to go forth as a lecturer, particularly in vindication of the rights of women. Immediately after her graduation, Stone attempted to begin public lecturing while teaching to pay off her college debt. Her first women's rights lecture was from the pulpit of her brother Bowman's church in Gardner. Another was in Warren, a village neighboring her hometown. For others, no documentation survives. The following spring, when Abby Kelly asked how her women's rights work was going, Stone admitted she didn't know how to get started. Kelly persuaded her to take a temporary post with the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, promising she'd learn the mechanics of itinerant lecturing while getting plenty of experience in public speaking. Stone began lecturing for the Anti-Slavery Society in June, 1848. And by the end of the summer, she had achieved a budding reputation as an effective speaker. Then an exciting possibility arose for her to begin her women's rights work with organizational support. This, as I said, was the summer of 1848. Stone most likely learned of the Seneca Falls Convention from the Liberator's account reprinted from a Seneca Falls paper. It included the convention's Declaration of Sentiments, which pledged to employ agents, circulate tracts, and petition legislatures. Although not mentioned in Stanton's reminiscences, a series of surviving letters show that Stone wrote to Lucretia Mott, telling of her intention to make women's rights her life work. Mott forwarded the letter to Stanton, who then proposed to another convention organizer that they engage Stone. Stone was contacted about the possible employment and she replied that she could begin as soon as she completed her anti-slavery commitment in the spring. While awaiting possible employment in New York, Stone pressed ahead with agitation in Massachusetts. In March, 1849, the Massachusetts legislature received its first woman suffrage petition headed by the signature of William Lloyd Garrison, with a second section of signatures headed by Wendell Phillips, cut from another petition and pasted onto this one. While there's no documented link between this petition and Stone, circumstantial evidence is strong that she initiated it. Six weeks later, Stone was in Philadelphia speaking for Lucretia Mott at Pennsylvania's first women's rights meeting. And then, Stone spent the summer of 1849 studying law books and preparing lectures for her expected employment. But the New York engagement never materialized, probably because of a lack of money. The lack of funding was a stumbling block as well to Stone beginning women's rights work on her own. As an anti-slavery agent, her lecture, travel, and accommodation arrangements were all made for her and she received a salary. But as an independent lecturer, Stone would be on her own. She had to book her own halls, arrange her own advertising and travel, and pay expenses from her own purse. Unprepared to do this, in the fall of 1849, Stone enlisted for a second term with the Anti-Slavery Society. Wherever she could, she worked women's rights lectures around her anti-slavery assignments, but only a handful of these lectures survives. During her second term as an anti-slavery agent, Stone achieved a milestone in women's rights agitation when she conducted the nation's first 
mass petition drive for woman suffrage. Assisted by Phillips and Garrison, Stone began the campaign in December, 1849. She had a petition printed, mailed it to friends to circulate, and the Liberator published it several times for, le for readers to copy or clip. Stone circulated the petition herself during her anti-slavery travels, supporting it with women's rights lectures wherever possible. The Liberator published appeals for circulation from both Stone and Phillips and directions for returning the petitions to Stone for submission to the legislature. She sent 13 petitions with nearly 400 signatures. Stone ended her two years with the Anti-Slavery Society in May 1850 and arranged what she no doubt expected to use to begin her independent work for women's rights. Unfortunately, fate had different plans. With Garrison's assistance, Lucy Stone held a meeting in Boston on May 30th, 1850, after the close of the New England Anti-Slavery Convention, where she proposed what became the first National Women's Rights Convention. Although not part of the traditional record of this convention, Stone's report to the Liberator shows that it was this very large public meeting that voted to hold a women's rights convention the following fall and appointed seven women as an arrangements committee. From this committee, Lucy Stone and, when, and uh, Paulina Wright Davis were assigned to issue the call and to serve as a committee of correspondence to recruit signatures to the call, recruit convention speakers and other convention participants. After completing her part of the preliminary arrangements, Stone went west, expecting to return in plenty of time to complete convention preparations. But while there, she contracted typhoid fever and for nearly a month lay near death at a roadside inn. Lucy Stone's name headed the convention call, but she made it home just two weeks before the convention. She spoke and served on committees, but was too frail to fill her expected leading role. After the convention, instead of beginning full-time work for women's rights, Lucy spent the next eight months convalescing, too weak to travel or lecture. During this convalescence, however, she managed to conduct another petition drive by mail and sent the legislature more signatures than she had the previous year. After regaining her health, Stone began her career as a full-time independent women's rights lecturer in the fall of 1851. She had resigned her anti-slavery agency, but the society's general agent kept uh, pressing assignments on her. Finally, insisting that her weekdays were reserved for women's rights, she agreed to accept Sunday anti-slavery engagements. The Sunday anti-slavery work turned out to be of great benefit. Whereas Stone had been paid $6 a week as a full-time anti-slavery agent, now she received $4 for Sunday work alone. And by arranging women's rights lectures in the vicinity, of her Sunday assignments, she reached more places than she could have without them. A real turning point in her career came the following fall. When Stone went to New York for the third National Women's Rights Convention at Syracuse, she took a fully developed persuasive power to a field not as accustomed to female speakers as New England had become. A newspaper editor, said he went to the convention, strongly opposed to the movement and in particular prejudiced against women speakers. But he said Stone melted ev away every bit of his hostility. Evidently, in arguing for women to be allowed to exercise their God-given skills and talents, Stone told a story she often used about the difficulties faced by one woman in particular, whom she said, God made a sculptor. When she ended her speech, said the editor, he turned away in a state of subdued perplexity and said to himself, well, whether we like it or not, little woman, God made you an orator. 
A few days later, after Stone's speech at a grand anti-slavery rally, another editor exclaimed that he had never seen an audience so absolutely in the possession of the orator. He said Stone swayed the audience from one emotion to another as if it was the helpless plaything of her inspiration. Garrett Smith, who was running for Congress on a platform that included anti-slavery and woman suffrage, asked Stone to lecture in his congressional district. Upon his victorious election, the New York Tribune said no other lecturer could have made a third of the converts for Smith as Lucy Stone had done. Susan B. Anthony sought Stone's help at two meetings in Seneca Falls. At one, Stone's speech helped preserve the provision for co-education in the prospectus of a state-supported industrial college. The next day, Stone, uh, Stone spoke at a meeting of temperance women who were trying to gain acceptance into the male-run state society. But some women, intimidated by recent criticism, wanted to retreat and just continue working separately. Stone persuaded them to stay the course and follow their consciences, though the heavens fall. This was the beginning of Stone and Anthony's collaboration and friendship. Immensely pleased with Stone's effect in Western New York, a prominent reformer arranged lectures for her the following spring in New York City. Attending these lectures were Horace Greeley, editor of the New York Tri Tribune, and P.T. Barnum, whom we remember as a showman, but who was at this time the editor of New York's first pictorial weekly. Both sent glowing reports of Stone's lectures across the country. With Barnum's report was an illustration of Stone, which shows us how she appeared at the time, with short skirt, the bloomer dress, and short hair. Stone was now receiving invitations from across New York and beyond, but she declined all to return to her home state and conduct her next petition drive, directed not to the legislature as before, but to the Constitutional Convention scheduled to convene in May, 1853. Launching the campaign in December, Stone lectured across the state for four months, carrying with her a petition asking the convention to strike the word male from wherever it occurred in the constitution. She had this simple one sentence petition pre printed on a circular before a full page appeal for signatures written for her by Wendell Phillips and signed by 28 notable public figures asking their fellow citizens to join them in petitioning the constitutional convention. This year, instead of a few hundred signatures, Stone submitted 3,000. She also sent more than 400 signatures on a second petition signed only by women, asking that women be permitted to vote on any changes made to the Constitution. Granted a hearing, Stone achieved another milestone. Her hearing before the Convention's Committee on the Qualification of Voters on May 27, 1853, was the first legislative hearing ever granted on woman suffrage. Although Stone's speech was not preserved, the liberator said her depiction of the wrongs suffered by women denied their rights deeply moved the assembly with both men and women shedding tears. This alludes to Stone's storytelling ability and vivid portrayal of real life cases to which Stone's contemporaries attributed much of her persuasive power. But Stone's powers of persuasion did not move the Constitutional Convention. Instead, noting that only 2,000 women had signed the suffrage petitions and signed a recent temperance petition, the convention concluded that the majority of women willingly consented to being governed by men. In the fall of 1853, Lucy Stone agreed to let Henry Blackwell arrange a lecture tour for her in the West. Blackwell, who had begun wooing Stone earlier that year, was the traveling partner in a Cincinnati business, either by going ahead himself 
or by telegraphing business connections. He booked auditoriums and arranged publicity for Stone throughout Ohio and Indiana, and in Louisville, St. Louis, and Chicago. Everywhere, Stone attracted standing room only crowds. An Indianapolis paper said Stone set about two thirds of the women in town crazy after women's rights, placed half the men in a similar predicament, and left behind a lively newspaper debate that raged for weeks after her departure. Stone's St. Louis lectures attracted the largest crowds ever assembled in the city. Classes at a medical college were suspended so students and faculty could attend the lectures. And a minister with his congregation's consent canceled the Christmas Eve service so all could go and hear Lucy Stone. Newspaper accounts of this Western tour clinched Lucy Stone's nationwide fame, making her a highly sought speaker by lyceums and other paying venues. At last, Stone had established herself as a self-supporting independent speaker. During her Western tour and the months following it, Lucy Stone used four stock lectures on women's legal and political disabilities, on their educational and employment rights, on issues relating to marriage and the Bible position on women. Because she spoke extemporaneously, Few written drafts or notes of her speeches survive. However, there are thousands of newspaper reports of her lectures, some by hired phonographers who practiced a form of phonetic based shorthand. Even so, Stanton said that no reporter or any written word of history could do justice to Stone's eloquence and power. While we have few of Stone's actual speeches, we have hundreds of accounts of their effect. For example, Stone's lecture in support of a school suffrage campaign was said to have reversed the sentiments of the entire town. Her lecture exhorting young women to knock on doors closed against them inspired a young woman to recruit 11 others to join her in trying to gain admission to the State University in Michigan. After Stone's lectures at Rockland, Maine, three young women sought jobs at local printing and accounting offices and were hired. The Stone also elected a woman as registrar of deeds, but when some residents tried to remove her, arguing that it was unconstitutional for a woman to hold public office, others got up a counter effort and saved the woman's job. Public figures and future suffrage leaders, such as Mary Livermore and Julia Ward Howe, and even Susan Anthony herself, said it was Lucy Stone who converted them to the need for woman suffrage. Anthony described Stone as possessing powers of eloquence and loveliness of character that win all who once hear the sound of her voice. Other contemporaries said Stone's power came from her sincere and simple style, her ability to demonstrate empathy with her audience and win their goodwill, her unassailable logic and delightful wit, and of course, her masterful storytelling. Stone also had an unusually rich and melodious voice, described as sounding like a silver bell. Altogether, Stone possessed a charm and charisma that disarmed prejudice and converted thousands. By the fall of 1854, Stone's name was a household word across the land. She was praised in the North for her courage and devotion to righteous causes and denounced in the South as the most prominent advocate of the North's wild schemes. Papers published poems celebrating her majesty of mind and impulse true and pure while a colleague called Stone a providence of history, a correspondent to the New York Tribune said she was the very heart and soul of the women's rights movement. Abandoning her resolution to remain single rather than become subjected to the legal disabilities of a wife, Lucy Stone married Henry Blackwell on May 1st, 1855. Blackwell had convinced Stone that they could establish a marriage of equal partnership despite what law said. 
and he had drawn up a marriage agreement through which Stone could retain her financial and personal independence. And as part of the marriage ceremony, he renounced the superior rights that law would give him as a husband. By the time Lucy Stone married, she had lectured in 16 of the nation's 31 states, as well as in Washington, D.C., and even Ontario. For the first year after her marriage, she lived with the Blackwell family in Cincinnati, and the West became the theater of her labor. Nearly all of Stone's lectures during the winter of 1856 were part of a multi-state petition campaign adopted by the National Women's Rights Convention meeting in Cincinnati. In addition to lecturing in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, Stone personally initiated woman suffrage petitioning in Wisconsin. She printed a petition for the Wisconsin legislature, lectured across the state, recruited volunteers to circulate the petition, and found two state legislators willing to present the petitions and get them referred to select committees. After Stone and Blackwell moved east the following September, Stone carried out week-long lecture tours throughout the eastern states. By then, however, the escalating sectional conflict over slavery was drawing so many women's rights activists into anti-slavery work that it was impossible to sustain petition drives. So, the 1856 National Convention adopted Stone's proposal that it memorialize state legislatures as a national organization, instead of attempting more individual state campaigns. Of the 25 legislatures to whom the memorial was mailed, four assigned it to select committees, and two of those, Massachusetts and Maine, granted hearings. Stone and Wendell Phillips represented the movement at both hearings in March, 1857. Six months after these hearings, Stone gave birth to her daughter. When Alice was four months old, Stone cradled her in her arms on the porch of their Orange, New Jersey home, while some of her household furnishings were sold at public auction, the consequence of Stone's refusal to pay her real estate tax. The preceding month, Stone had returned her tax bill unpaid with the letter to the collector saying she would not pay the tax until she possessed the right to vote. After the auction, Stone and her husband lectured together on taxation without representation and circulated a petition, suffrage petition, to the New Jersey legislature. While they agitated locally, newspaper reports of Stone's tax protest flew across the country. In at least four states, a number of women followed Stone's example and refused to pay their taxes. Alice's birth severely curtailed Stone's public speaking. Although she continued to accept some one-night engagements, she abandoned lecture tours. In 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, when the New York legislature passed a far-reaching Married Women's Property Act, the movement's most significant achievement to date. The editor of the New York Times said he didn't see what more than this, Mrs. Lucy Stone can ask of the state of New York. So despite her reduced activity to that editor, as to the rest of the country, Lucy Stone was still the movement's leading figure whose very name represented the women's rights movement. Now, after the Civil War, the women's rights movement became the women's suffrage movement. Not immediately though. Meeting for the first time since before the war, the National Women's Rights Convention adopted the goal of universal suffrage to enfranchise both women and blacks. And it reorganized as the American Equal Rights Association. Members tried to persuade Congress to include women in the 14th Amendment's suffrage clause and failed. Then they tried to persuade Congress to add sex to race, color, and previous condition of servitude as the 15th Amendment's basis upon which suffrage could not be denied. When it became apparent that the 15th Amendment would pass without that addition, woman suffrage leaders disagreed on how to proceed. Lucy Stone proposed a 16th Amendment 
a separate woman's suffrage amendment to the Constitution to follow the 15th. This position accepted the reality that the 15th Amendment was going to pass, and its passage would enfranchise Black men or women. Elizabeth Stanton and Susan Anthony could not accept this. They continued to oppose passage of the 15th Amendment, and when it did pass, they campaigned against its ratification. It was this disagreement over the 15th Amendment that divided women's rights advocates into two women's suffrage associations, the National, led by Anthony and Stanton, and the American, led primarily by Stone. Tactics, leadership style, and other factors made the division personal and bitter, and so complicated the scholars today have differing interpretations about the division, which lasted 20 years. After the split, Lucy Stone remained pivotal to the woman suffrage movement, but the venue of her work changed about the time she began promoting the 16th Amendment in 1868. She had injured her voice during the previous year's grueling suffrage campaign in Kansas and was not able to speak as she had before. Stone withdrew from lecturing just as scores of women surged into the profession that she had helped open to them. But she continued to speak at women's suffrage meetings and to address state legislatures. She made the trek to our state house to appeal for women's suffrage nearly every year for the rest of her life. I think it's important to understand that in continuing to seek suffrage amendments to state constitutions, the American Association did not abandon the goal of a federal amendment, as most 20th century scholars concluded. Rather, it simply tried to get suffrage passed wherever possible as a means of enfranchising as many women as possible until the federal amendment could enfranchise all. And state campaigns helped to create public demand for the federal amendment. In addition to leading the Women's Suffrage Association, uh, the American Women's Suffrage Association, which scholars agree was the larger and more active of the two associations until the mid 80s, Stone edited the Women's Journal, a weekly women's rights paper that had thousands of subscribers across the United States and in other countries. So as both leader of the American Association and editor of the Women's Journal, Lucy Stone remained a major voice of the women's suffrage movement until her death in 1893 at the age of 75. And now I invite any questions you might have. Hello. Hi, Katrina. How are you? Good. Wow, that was fabulous. I am so excited. This was, it was your great storyteller i um Thank everything you. yes absolutely everything that you gave us you you took us on this journey of you took us on a lucy stone journey um and was able to uh give us a lens of of her beginnings and 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 how she and and her social justice um um journey and speaking of, I, I like how you be, you started the your discussion off. You said something like, um, "We may or may not know Lucy, right? She's the right. daughter of Massachusetts, and we may or may not know her." What do you think? Do, do pe are people familiar with Lucy Stone? I mean, Freddie and I have this conversation all the time. We say we just want people to know about the suffrage movement. Not too many people know about the suffrage movement. Uh -huh. They may know about suffragists, but they don't really know about the movement. Now, what, do you think people understand the huge impact that Lucy Stone made on the suffrage movement? Well, my experience is that um, if people know about suffragists, they know Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Yes. And if some people are familiar with the story of the movement, they might know that after the Civil War, there was this split and um, the, the party split. 
But my experience is that those people who do know something about the pre-war period, the antebellum period, mm -hmm. most of it, Lucy Stone is a footnote. They don't see her as one of the major leaders instead of, in my view, she was the primary leader. And that's why, um, and that's what I discovered. I started out researching Susan B. Anthony, came across um, <laughs> Lucy Stone and then switched the focus because I didn't know about Lucy Stone. And, um, and I find that that remains so today. Perhaps in Massachusetts, more people have heard of her. But if you go outside of Massachusetts, um, not many people have heard of her or have any idea of the magnitude of her work. No, absolutely. I agree with you. I don't think many people know about Lucy Stone and, and, and her leadership and the right. major um, piece of what she contributed to the suffrage movement, but not only the, the suffrage movement, but the anti-slavery movement, mm -hmm. right? Like right. she started as a teenager uh, working with William Garrison, right? And so uh, she was influenced as a teenager. And, and influenced, she yes, her, yes, you yeah, She didn't go to college till she was 25. <laughs> yes. Um, so let's talk about, can you talk about that a little bit? How did sure. that be, how did she um, grow in that role around from starting with um, the anti-slavery movement, movement into the suffrage movement? Okay, well, Garrison knew right from the start, as did all the uh, abolitionists in Massachusetts, knew that Stone was just here as an anti-slavery uh, lecturer temporarily. They knew where she was going with women's rights, but they were very supportive. And when Lucy Stone did fi finally start her full-time work, she had already this large network of abolitionists who supported her, who hosted her, who um, um, arranged uh, accommodations for her. And as people say, well, was she as famous uh, as an anti-slavery lecturer as she was a woman's mm -hmm. rights? And of course, yes, she was. Um, her storytelling ability especially would shine out. Um, I'm thinking of probably one of her most famous anti-slavery lectures, which was called The Fugitive Mother. And this she gave in New York City where papers denounced her or criticized her for her graphic distinctness because this she told the story of a, a fugitive mother running for her life with her baby or mm -hmm. the child on her shoulders. And she was pursued by slave catchers who shot at her and killed the baby. And the mother had to leave the baby on the planes and keep running. And of course, you can see how this story would move her auditors. But the newspaper editor said, ah, that was more <laughs> than we needed. But Frederick Douglass compared Stone's effect and timing on uh, the anti-slavery platform in arresting public attention and sympathy against slavery to Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. They, Stone's uh, effectiveness as an anti-slavery agent and uh, the, the appearance of that novel came about the same time. And of course, the novel went on to have much more influence. So we might think this was a little hyperbolic of uh, Douglas, but he was making the point that she was a great force in um, uh, bringing attention to and sympathy with the anti-slavery movement. And then I might say too that I mentioned already that she had this reputation in the South as being this wild advocate of North, of North wildness. But uh, she was also a, po a very popular speaker on the anti-slavery circuit. She appeared in Lyceum lecture courses with other noted anti-slavery orators as Wendell Phillips, Edward Everett, uh, who appeared with Lincoln at Gettysburg, and, um, Horace Greeley and others. So yes, she was, um, while she, at one point she, early on she merged or blended women's rights with anti-slavery. Later on, she blended anti-slavery with women's rights. Mm -hmm. She still was um, uh, a member and served on committees at anti-slavery conventions. And she did uh, have very many major anti-slavery lectures. 
So many people are wondering, and I'm looking through the chat at least three times, people are asking, why do you think Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth um, Staten, Can um, Canton Staten uh, have more notoriety than uh, Lucy Stone? Why do people seem to know yeah. these? Well, there reasons? are, I would say, um, the four distinct reasons, each one <laughs> dependent on the other before that. Uh, first of all, Lucy Stone's work is not contained in the history of women's suffrage, and that mm -hmm. grew out of the, the division and the hostilities between the two. But um, even Gerda Lerner, who uh, is considered the mother of uh, women's history as an academic subject, recognized the history of women's suffrage as a very incomplete, flawed, and biased account. And she said it was factionally biased, especially against those people who split in 1869. And this was particularly so in the case of Lucy Stone. Her work is simply downplayed and minimized there. Then in the 20th century, when scholars started getting interested, women scholars especially, started getting interested in uh, the women's suffrage movement, the history of women's suffrage was the source to go to. And it was accepted pretty much unquestioningly until about um, the, 18, the 1970s, the 1980s, when there were several um, scholars, Gerda Lerner among them, who questioned um, its um, completeness. And so, so when, with the Equal Rights Amendment, when interest in the earlier movement arose, it was the Stanton, what I call the Stanton Anthony tradition um, that became the story. And once you have an accepted story, it's very hard to break it or to, to challenge it. When Ken Burns was uh, preparing his documentary, he interviewed um, um, Kerr, another biographer of Stone, intending to give Lucy Stone her, her due. Mm -hmm. But ultimately he decided that the story was more, his word, compelling, told from the view of the Stanton Anthony friendship. So, and, and now today, as more and more scholars are saying, hey, 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 look, take another look at Lucy Stone, very few scholars access her papers. Um, she has her papers are under the Blackwell family papers. So maybe they don't think to look there, I don't know. But she has a, a couple of collections at the Library of Congress, a, co a couple of collections at um, Schlesinger a Library. Plus she's in, uh, her work is, is, especially her early work is in anti-slavery papers. And not many scholars look at the Liberator or anti other anti-slavery papers to learn about women's rights. And then, of course, she, I think her papers are as voluminous as the Stanton Anthony papers. with The uh, collections of correspondence and newspaper clippings, newspapers, and she lectured across the country. And I have gone to um, historical societies in Wisconsin and Iowa and Illinois. And you can always find correspondence and newspaper clippings about Stone's work. So it's there. It's just that scholars haven't recognized her as a leading figure and therefore have been interested in, in st studying her. That's my, my feeling anyway. No, absolutely. Uh, it seems like people want to get a little bit more personal, personal and understanding um, her family relationship. Could you speak briefly on Lucy Stone's family and how they have funds to send her to an expensive higher education college as, such as um, Mount Holyoke? Oh, they didn't send her anywhere. <laughs> Lucy's uh, had three brothers, um, all, two of whom went to college. The third one didn't. Um, but they had to work their way through, um, just as Lucy did. When Lucy, she uh, finished her uh, primary education at age 16, and then she was qualified to teach in district schools, and she would teach and then use the money that she earned uh, to go to a term. She saved her money at first to go to Mount Holyoke. When she left Mount Holyoke, she'd teach and then go to an academy back and forth. When she went to Oberlin, she went on borrowed funds mm. and then um, taught there in Ohio to 
uh, in district schools, and then she was hired in this college's preparatory school, which would be like a high school. And that's where her strike for equal pay occurred because she was hired at half the rate of her male colleagues. And so, but then when she wrote home about that struggle to her father, he said, I, he said, I never thought that a child of mine would have to get up at three in the morning to, to work and do all this. And she, he said, have no more qualms about it. You will get all the money you need. And so he bought up the loans that she had taken from other neighbors. And so when she graduated, she only owed him. And her sister said, don't bother to pay him back. It's only our father. And Lucy said, no, I'm going to pay him back. And so that's why after her graduation, she went back to teaching and then used her income from anti-slavery speaking to pay her father back. So, no, she was not sent to college. She did it on her own. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. She has she's such amazing. I think we only have time for one more question. Um, and there's so many here, but um, this last question I would like to ask you. Um, if Lucy was alive today, what do you think her role would be? Well, of course, the job isn't done yet. I think she'd be among those women who are trying to revive the Equal Rights Amendment. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, and and uh, yes, constitutions, laws, but to her, um, a woman's right to autonomy to themselves was even more important than suffrage. And that's why one reason uh, she had an opportunity when Boston passed, I don't know if it was school suffrage or municipal suffrage, and she went down and registered and the director said, erased her name and said, no, you have to register as Mrs. Blackwell. And she refused to do it. Mm -hmm. And she mm -hmm. said, what good is the right to vote if you can't keep your own body in your control? She and her husband had an agreement that she would be in charge of their sexual relations and her freedom and her movement. And I think she would be working for that to help women become um, self-autonomous. And her keeping her name was part of that sense of keeping yourself, your own identity and your self-autonomy. Absolutely. That actually was a question we had, but we are just running out of time because you're so fabulous. And I mean, just what you were saying to me is that she would have uh, been part of the reproductive justice movement that's happening, especially now um, in, in so many different ways because it, it, it just has so many layers to it. So mm -hmm. we would like to thank you. I would like to thank you. I see Freddie is here to do closing remarks and uh, we appreciate all you have done for us today. Thank and what you. And you do in society. Thank you so much. Take thank it away, you for Freddie. the opportunity. Thank Absolutely. you, Joelle and Katrina. That was fantastic. And I feel like we could go on for an hour or more, but our time is up. Um, I just want to mention that this was recorded and you will all be receiving a link by email in the next few days. And also, I just want to say if any of you, um, we could tell that we couldn't get to all of your questions. We'll try to save them, see if we can be in touch. I see that um, uh, that folks have many questions in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, Judge Borders, so nice to have you join us. Thank you. So we'll try to see if we can get back to you in some way. There's also on our website, contact us. Uh, it's easy, easy to find, suffrage100ma.org. Um, you could, uh, uh, if you wanted to submit a question there, I'll twist Joelle's arm and see yeah. if I'll be able to send you. Gladly, gladly. Answer. I want to um, let you see the book, Women's Voice, Women's Place. And when we send you an email about this event, we'll try to give you more information about the book in case that's something that might interest you. 
Um, and I want to ask everyone to please check out our social media, Su Suffrage 100 MA, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We are including lots of wonderful history that, you know, we're all learning so much to learn. And I really appreciate you doing that. So I want to thank everyone again, especially Joelle. And thank, thank you. you so much for joining us tonight, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.